Hello and welcome to the Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan and my guest today is the Global CEO of Mastercard, Michael Mubeck. Thanks very much for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. What a pleasure to have you in India and on the program, your first visit as CEO of Mastercard. Uh, and you picked, you picked quite the week as we celebrate 75 years of our independence. Picking that week was by design. So I'm delighted to be here, delighted to be on the show with you. Um, you know, there were choices when to come, and I couldn't think of a more auspicious week, actually, than to join the celebrations. I did find, though, that it's also a week of vacation. So, yes, you know, it was, plenty I, I of let, vacation. Let, a little bit of flexibility was required, but uh, a fantastic visit. Got a really good sense of everything that's going on so, in So India. let me ask you for a pulse check on India today. Right. Uh, you've had meetings with your clients, with your customers, with right. your team, and, of course, with government officials right, as right. well. As you leave India, uh, in comparison to the sense that you had about the economy, about your business here, about MasterCard's plans right, for right. India uh, in 2018, which was when you last visited, you know, give me a pulse and a mood check on where things currently stand. Right. A almost physical sense of optimism. I mean, it's probably helped by the fact that you look back on 75 years and then you know, all the achievements. But I, I, my reference point was really the visit four years ago in 2018. What I see today particularly through the lens of our business, when, when we look at the digital economy and how it's growing in India and you know, the growth rates of UPI and so forth, there is technology put to work at scale in unprecedented ways in India. And as a tech company and as a tech geek, I find that hugely exciting. So I'm going to go back um, and see there's models emerging in India that we should all think about and see what else we can do and how we evolve our business in partnerships with fintechs and other companies that are using this technology here in India. That was the conversation at the dinner tables last night here in the hotel. You know, so I just want to take that point forward. Uh, from your strategy of buy, build, or sort of partner, uh, right. where does India fit into that strategy currently? And what is it going to mean in terms of future right, investments? Right. So let, let me just say a few things. We're not a credit card company to start with, so let's just... <laughs> I, I think that, that transition you've been on for the last couple of years. Let's, let's just baseline on, on that. So as a payment technology company, we kind of broadly speaking, what we do, our strategy is be in payments, whatever, a choice of payments is there. Like India is offering a lot more choice in payments than was there even five years ago. So it might have been cards, and now it's, it's UPI, it's account to accounts, push payments. You, 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 you want it, you have it in India. So we want to offer solutions in all those spaces. That's our stated strategy. It's different in different countries. And here in India, certainly there's more choice and better for that. But then that's also the question. So if you have that rapidly rising digital economy with all these different payment choices for people, how do you keep it safe? How do you keep it simple? That's another part of our strategy where we say every kind of service that makes this simple Take, address the cyber risks, uh, is your digital identity compromised, all those kind of things we take care of and we then partner. And that comes to the partnership point. We say on payments, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of partnerships required, for example, on nascent areas of payments, B2B payments. There's a lot of inefficiency in B2B, B2B payments, which we bring solutions to the party. Um, basic P2P payments, here in India, UPI is a, yeah. you know, an amazing success. We don't really need to partner on that, but the question on cybersecurity and how do you make sure that these payments remain safe as this becomes one of the, if not the largest digital economy in the world, that's a partnership area. Then you go into some of the big questions that India is addressing that many other countries will face, and that's the question of an inclusive digital yeah. economy. Hundreds of millions of people. You are, you know, we think there's going to be 100 million people that join the formal digital economy in India in the next couple of years. Who else? How do you do this? And what partnerships are required? We've been on a financial inclusion trip for years. I ran our Africa business. That's why I got really in tune with that topic. And I think there's amazing uh, drive here on that. There's technology developed here but we also have experience that we can bring to the party. So all sorts of partnerships uh, across the board. And in my conversation with our employees here, look at us, where is it going? Where is the puck going? What else can we bring to India's journey to make that digital 
India vision a reality. So where is the puck going? Uh, you know, and especially in the context of financial inclusion, right. voice commerce, for instance. And I know that this is something that you talk about, and this is something that you believe right. in as well. What kind of innovations can we expect out of India that can possibly right. be exportable? I think in the end, where it's going to go, pay every which way you want, whenever you want, always on the basis of it's safe and secure. So I think that's the headline. And you know, that turns out in many different ways. It's going to be paying in the metaverse. Um, it's going to be paying through voice. It's going to be paying offline in areas of the country where you have no GSM coverage or it's not as good as it needs to be. So every bit of uh, technology that's there today is going to give us a huge boost because all that is at disposal in India. So I wouldn't think there is one particular technology my general answer on when, when I think about the future of payments and the future of technology is convergence of a lot of fundamental underlying technologies, AI, 5G or 6G, um, cloud, edge computing, all of that will make sure that you can do whatever you want whenever you want it in terms of payments at all times. This is converging, gives you all, uh, all sorts of data. I think the question of trust and security is really the most important in a digital economy. Imagine that small business that is starting to, is reopening the doors after COVID and then now they have a digital business because they felt that during COVID that was a thing and now they're going to operate in a different way than they had before, but they have not learned how to keep their business safe. That trust issue, if something goes wrong, that's going to be um, a problem, not only for that one business, because people talk, and then the whole app, and, you know, small and micro businesses, um, I think are not going to take all the potential from the digital economy. So trust and security is super important. That's what we, uh, what we stand for, what we bring. And it was a good part of the conversations with government as well mm -hmm. here. You know, uh, just sort of looking not just at India but at the regulatory environment around right. the world and specifically about the regulatory environment here in mm -hmm. India. It's been a challenging year and a half or so. Uh, you know, the RBI didn't allow you to onboard customers because of the data storage uh, rules uh, which changed. You now have the ability to do that again. But what mm -hmm. impact did that have on your business? Right. Uh, and you know, how do you potentially de-risk yourself uh, from matters like this going forward? Right. Shireen, I'd, I'd like to take your cue and look at the world um, and then we come to India on this. So basically what we're seeing in, in the digital economy is at, at the intersection of financial services and digital economy is regulators that want to ensure sanctity of the system, resilience of the system, you know, effectiveness of monetary policy and so forth. And then you have fintechs, you have new technology coming in and how do you bring these two worlds together? Because you want innovation. At the same time, you want stability and you want security. And that's what a lot of the conversation, the school of regulators, there's increasing connectivity. The BIS is bringing the central banks together. They're all talking to each other. And we're an active part of that dialogue where we say we're kind of somewhere in the middle. We are the largest fintech around, but also we're not at the bleeding edge. We're at the leading edge. And I think we can bring a, a perspective in the middle. What we've seen here uh, in, in India is um, a lot of that new technology being deployed and I think the market oftentimes is ahead of the regulator yeah. as in saying well, we'll try this out. So regulatory clarity on emerging topics around the world we see it in crypto for example yeah. and, and blockchain is not quite there yet. So that active dialogue to bring that there. Here what we had is we had challenging 10 months um, um, in, in India for sure, but uh, we resolved the matter with the RBI, cooperative open dialogue, and uh, we think um, we are now exactly where the country needs to go, and um, now we're engaging the market again. And what was really rewarding is the keenness um, of the market participants and customers to reach out again and say, okay, so what can we do together? So that's behind us. We look forward and we're excited about where this is going to go here in India in terms of this digital economy. So, you know, I am going to try and elicit a number from you in terms of what okay. it could mean in terms of fresh investments for India, given the fact that you're right, right, so right. confident about uh, right, the growth right, story right. here. So right. potentially, what could we see? Right. So, you know, First of all, tell me, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how important India is for, for MasterCard. So it's a big business, but everything that we just covered on what is being built in terms of a digital economy here, this, this has model character. 
So I look at this as like it's, it, yeah, in a fishbowl, there's like this big fish that's circling and that, that is India and then a lot of people are going to look into this fishbowl and say that's a model, that's interesting. We might be uh, seeing more you know, global stack uh, kind of ideas elsewhere. So from that perspective it's important we have been investing and you know we've been on a record here in, in India um, to say you know two, uh, two billion that we uh, will be investing in in the country and we're just executing against that in R&D in people in solutions in technology this is the reason I have to cover four cities in three days is because <laughs> I'm going to see all of that and and make sure that we are on track and understand where things are going so from an investment and resource allocation perspective, we are just reflecting the importance of India that we believe is being drawn up in terms of this digital future. Mm -hmm. The talk of recession is gaining momentum right. across across different economies at this point in time, whether we talk about the US or UK or the slowdown in China. Uh, and typically that hasn't impacted your business. You know, previous downturns haven't necessarily impacted your business. But as you look at the risks that are playing out uh, for various economies today, okay. you know, how do you ring fence yourself so um, I resisted using the R word uh, in in our last uh, conference call with with the analysts and investors um, and frankly that's that's for a reason if we think back about the financial crisis 2008 2009 if you look at the state of the world then vis-a-vis -vis the state of the world we don't have an asset bubble we have what we have on the other hand is we have high strong employment I mean, unemployment numbers have gone down since yeah. pre-crisis, so we, we, are, we are in good shape. We have had many stimulus programs here in India, the U.S., in Europe that went to individual consumers. The consumer balance sheet is much stronger than it was back then. So if you then look at that underlying thing, yes, there is pressure on energy prices, there's pressure on air tickets, we just talked about that. So there's some inflationary pressures, but you also have more decisive actions from central bankers around the world who are stepping in to halt the, uh, the inflation or the, you know, prevent a further increase. So gives and takes, um, puts and takes um, around um, inflation, and I've not yet said the R word, and I will not. Uh, so we'll see. <laughs> so you don't, see, believe, well, we're headed, we, you don't we, believe we're headed into I, a recession? In the, in the short term, we are seeing that inflationary pressure will prevail, but the actions that central banks are taking, I, you know, we believe, will take hold. So then it's important to think if we make the bridge to our business. Not everything that is driving inflation is reflected in our business because where digital payments generally happen, the types of digital payments that we do is oftentimes not in rent, for example. It's oftentimes not in types of energy prices when it comes to utility payments for natural gas or things like that. So our basket vis-a-vis -vis the overall CPE is a different kind of basket. And hence there's why there's some cushioning happening as well. Fundamentally, as price levels increase, there's a short-term benefit in volumes, um, but uh, you know that is something that is generally passing because overall, if inflation prevails for a longer time, it's not good for anybody. Um, so we believe that the government actions that are being taken, particularly by the central banks, are showing effect. We see it in the United States. You see it in India. Actually, your inflation rates come down. I just want to get a sense from you in terms of growth, both organic as well as inorganic. And you've mm. done a plethora of acquisitions. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, given the spaces that you want to occupy and the areas that you right, want right. to consolidate in, what are the gaps currently that you're looking at that you would like right. to plug via inorganic growth or acquisitions? Yeah. So we're always, um, you know, there's investors that uh, were, were looking around and said, well, fintech, valuations are depressed. This is an opportunity to go in and buy X, Y, Z. Our starting point is we have a strategy, want to provide all the payment choices that are relevant, have a set of services around it to make these payments better. That's the starting point. So wh where are the gaps? Or rather, where's the opportunity? So one, I'll give you one recent example. We, we uh, closed on an acquisition of a company by the name of Dynamic Yield in mm. April this year. So a lot of businesses right now, as they come out of the stress of COVID, are trying to re-engage consumers, airlines, retailers, and so forth. So how do you do that? You could do mass emails, but that's so 80s, um, so nobody does that any longer. But how can I get hyper-personalized content that tells you, Shireen, here's what 
you said you like, and here is the offer at this uh, moment in time. Oftentimes that's related to a payment's journey because the payment will indicate what you have previously bought and, and all of that. So you bring all of this together, sets of data, preferences and so forth, and then the moment in time con super contextual hyper-personalized offers and saying at the right moment, here's your thing. Yeah. That's what Dynamic Yield does. It's a company that does that. So in the conversation with customers here in the market, everybody's re-engaging and trying to see, I want to be top of mind. I want to be in the customer's mind and say that my offer is a particularly relevant uh, offer. People don't think about MasterCard in that context, but that is what we do. Um, and uh, I'm delighted with, uh, with this particular acquisition. So more value before and after the payment transaction is kind of the headline. Uh, that's what we're looking and then the whole space of B2B that I touched on earlier. Mm. Massive momentum in the B2B space, a lot of specialists there. Um, more and more companies look at this as a source of value as you try to optimize their back office processes, your large, large conglomerates here in India, we're having these conversations is how do you make this easier? How do you use payment flows as a basis to get better credit access for medium-sized mm. companies that are not getting that? So providing that data back to a financier, which we don't do. Those are yeah. all activities that are going on and those are all very hot spaces. Uh, you know, as, as a global digital payments company today, right. if, if, if the previous... I like how you put that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> if, the, if the previous decade uh, or, or more than that was really about doing away with cash and moving to a right, cashless right. Uh, economy, right, right. Uh, and you're very clear that you don't believe that cards are going to be the future. Right. When when do we get to a card? They will be part of the future. Part of the future, right. but do you see a card-less future? I think in the end, a card is a form factor, which yeah. I love. It really works really very seamlessly. But it's a it's a credential. It's a tokenized credential of you and your financial identity, and it links to an account of some sort. Um, and I think we will keep that. Some sort of identifier that goes back to the individual and say this is my financial means and this is where my data is associated and so forth. The form factor will, it could be mobile, it could be anything. It could be completely biometric without a device. So that's a somewhat scary uh, thought, but it could be. You could, we've just launched something that uh, is essentially a facial biometric uh, payment. So you pay with your smile. Um, and that's not futuristic talk, it's actually a reality and it's, um, it's uh, safe and secure. We launched it f in 2014 initially. I think we were ahead of the time, a little too far ahead of the time, but it's coming back Probably. now. So pay with your smile, why not? So I think that is where these things are going. But, you know, in India, we currently don't have a data protection or a data privacy law. Right, right. So does that challenge uh, offerings like this? Um, <clears throat> I think we have to be very, very careful about data and very thoughtful about data. Um, so your data should be yours. You should benefit from it and nobody else. Um, and for a company like ours, we should keep it safe. By the way, those are exactly our data principles. That's how we operate. Um, data compliance, regulatory compliance is important, but the coordination and level of data regulation around the world is not yet in line with the market. Back to our earlier conversation, sometimes technology in the market is ahead. We try to be the adult in the room and make sure that we bridge that gap and don't be on the bleeding edge and uh, drive that. But I think there's an interesting conversation around how is data an element of innovation vis-a-vis -vis data privacy is in the way of innovation. And I think technology allows us to do this today. For example, tokenization is an interesting one. Here in, the, uh, in, in, in India, we have partnered with the RBI to drive tokenization. So that's a one-time number that safeguards your underlying payment details. And it can fly around in that. That is an element of data privacy, leveraging latest technology to make that work so you can bridge the gap between keeping data private and secure and for your benefit vis-a-vis -vis blocking innovation because you want to be a just think about security. So that's, I think, where the journey is going. Um, regulation, um, coordination, global coordination, that's a dialogue we have you know, at the G20 level, yeah. at the national level with the EU, who's been a leader in, uh, with GDPR and, and regulations like that to take some of these standards and put them elsewhere. We actually made it a global standard for our company.
you know, you talked about working with the RBI on tokenization. The RBI has just last night put out a discussion paper. I don't know if you've had a look at it or not, but um, you know, on all kinds of things, on regulating MDR right, and so right, on right, and right, so right. forth. Any thoughts on that preliminary? So it's, it's, it's breaking. We had this customer <laughs> dinner here last night and somebody came to me, hey, have you, Michael, have you, have you read that? And I hadn't read it at the time. So I just glanced over uh, this morning. Um, I find the thought process behind that and asking the kind of questions that, that were asked are the right kind of questions. They come to, they come to a point that I mentioned earlier. It's, it's not just about the technology. It's about the broader ecosystem and the kind of questions that are being asked about commercial sustainability because commercial sustainability often links into innovation. So I quite like uh, that consultation process. So we will certainly be um, engaging with the RBI and say, here's our experience and what we've seen and what we think can work here in India. You know, you mentioned where the puck goes right. a couple of times in the course of the conversation. I right. thought you might say where the ball goes. <laughs> <laughs> because rumor has it uh, that, right. that you're going to be placing a pretty big bet on something that unites all Indians, cricket. Right, the, the, nas the national passion. I heard about that rumor, <laughs> yes, yes. Are you going so, to confirm uh, that or not? <laughs> well, so I, I say a few things. Um, uh, sponsorships and passion is... It's, it's just something that w works for us. The term priceless, you know, when you, when you think about UEFA Champion League, there's so many priceless moments. In cricket, there's so many priceless moments, so it's just a natural fit to us. Whatever is a national pastime, uh, we, we, we are always interested. So there's active interest. Um, hasn't uh, so we're engaging. It's a potential opportunity, but it is a potential opportunity. So this is about as much as I can say right now, but I'm, uh, I'm very keen and interested on these kind of national sports. you follow cricket at all, though? Um, so I, got a, I actually played this um, one time. <laughs> the playing is probably the wrong word. I tried it uh, one time. I lived in the Middle East for a long time. I had a lot of Indian colleagues, and we went out to a cricket thing. And it struck me that it's weird to throw a ball on the floor uh, because, like, I grew up with soccer. That's not what you do. But uh, and the, if you just see the lit up faces and the, the passion around the sport, it's just fascinating. So we, we want to be associated with it. Well, let me end by asking you, Michael, mm. you know, uh, you, you've spoken about your strategic priorities in expanding value added services, right. on expanding networks, and of course, digital payments. Uh, where do you believe you are in that journey? How much have you been able to accomplish so far? And yeah. what would you prioritize in terms of the unfinished agenda? Right. So there is no end in the agenda. So it will always be unfinished. Uh, but I tell you today, more than a third of our revenue comes from services. So versus 10 years ago, we were largely in consumer-related payments. Today, services that are in cyber data analytics make up more than one third of the company. So that's a massive, massive progress. Um, but also the mix in payments has also changed quite dramatically. The originally consumer payments, now B2B, prepaid, cross-border payments, you name it. it. It is a whole menu. Everything that is relevant is on the menu and the diversification has shown. Um, you, know, you just talked about our earnings call. That has shown that we are, we've built a fairly resilient, diversified business that can even sustain an unprecedented pandemic. So I think always more to do we've come a long way. Well, we wish you the very best of luck. Thanks so much for joining us here in India, and we hope to have you back soon. Thank you, Shane. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of the Global Dialogue from all of us here on the team. Goodbye, and many thanks for watching.